Well, uh, good morning, everybody. So thank, uh, thank you for all for being here. Really excited to be speaking with you about uh, the Journal of Science, Policy, and Governance. My name is Shailen Jotishi. I serve as a CEO of JSPG. Uh, before we get started here, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the journal and introduce our really distinguished panel here. I'll just scoot, scoot behind this podium so I'm not blocking the view. Um, uh, I have a little bit of a PowerPoint presentation here, but I promise it'll be short. It won't take very much time at all. So, Journal of Science, Policy, and Governance, going to tell you a little bit about that. And I've been informed that my clicker is actually a mouse, so excuse me if I'm a little bit slow in transitioning here. Let's see if it works. There we go. So the Journal of Science, Policy, and Governance is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. We're an independent peer-reviewed journal, and we exist to help scientists and engineers uh, who are early in their career cut their teeth on science and technology policy writing and research. The journal's been around for about 10 years. Uh, we're students, policy fellows, and early career researchers, those within three years of earning their bachelor's, master's, or doctoral degree, or other terminal degrees, are eligible to submit to JSPG. The journal has uh, sort of a threefold mission. The first is to produce high quality science policy research and to contribute to policy debate in a wide variety of areas. The second is to contribute to the professional development of scientists and engineers who wish to transition into policy careers or contribute to policy and governance issues in their scientific and academic capacities. Click next here and hope the slide progresses. A little bit on our structure, and I'm actually going to move over to the side so I can follow along with you on the screen. A little bit on our structure, so we have an editorial staff of 18 associate editors that's led by our editor-in-chief, who is Christian Ross at the moment. Unfortunately, Christian's train got caught up, so he won't be able to join us uh, this morning, but uh, Christian is currently uh, at or Arizona State University and has a, a really great perspective on a wide variety of issues with special expertise in, in the biosecurity space. We have two associate editors-in-chief, one for special issues, which we'll talk about a little bit more, and one for our uh, standard issues. We have a, uh, a, a dedicated staff of six part-time folks, including myself, uh, that are dedicated to uplifting and elevating the issues published. So we're a little bit different uh, in that once articles come out of JSPG, we don't want it to just sit on the shelf on the internet. We actively want to reach out with our partners and other stakeholders to promote this work and get it into the hands of decision makers. We have a fantastic board uh, that is comprised of leaders in science and technology policy, and we have two of them here on our panel, Aaron Heath and Lita Benison. The board provides strategic uh, oversight and guidance on how best to elevate the mission and advance it uh, in, a, in a, a timely and um, uh, most impactful fashion. And we have an advisory board comprised of some of the most distinguished leaders in science and technology policy. They include, for example, um, Mr. Norm Augustine, the former CEO of Lockheed Martin, who's long been active in this space, uh, as well as Neil Lane, who is formerly director of the National Science Foundation and the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. The advisory board helps JSPG validate and uplift these early career voices and make sure that their perspective perspectives are relevant in policy discussions and debates. We work with the advisory board on various outreach projects as well as to help the journal maintain uh, validity and visibility in the science and technology policy arena. A little plug for our upcoming opportunities to submit for early career researchers and students in your networks. We have two standard issues a year. The deadline for 2020 will take place in May, uh, May 31st and November 15th. Uh, for our standard issues. Now, although the journal is called the Journal of Science, Policy, and Governance, science policy is broadly defined to refer policy for science as well as science for policy. So this includes issues relating to the environment, to STEM education, 
to internet governance, cybersecurity, health, national security. It's really any sort of policy topic that touches science and technology dimensions uh, is eligible for submission to JSPG. Formats tend to be geared towards general audiences. So this is another distinction compared to tr traditional peer review journals in that we really want our work to be relevant for policy makers, decision, make, uh, decision makers, and other stakeholders. Formats include op-eds, policy memos, analyses, technology assessments, workshop proceedings, book reviews, and other general formatted uh, articles on science and technology policy topics. So for those of you who even work with interns or graduate fellows on a regular basis, oftentimes they produce some written output at the end of their time with you. That output would be eligible for submission to JSPG. We also develop special editions in partnership with national and international science and technology policy organizations, including um, the Union of Concerned Scientists, the C uh, Canadian Science Policy Center, the United Nations Major Group for Children and Youth, and various universities. In 2020, we'll have two special editions. Special editions are un unique in that the focus is a little bit refined, a little bit more narrow, but we also embark in more outreach around special issues. So we have two special issues deadlines coming up in 2020. The first First is uh, sponsored by the United Nations Major Group for Children and Youth, it, which is around emerging technologies. This is really unique. So with this partnership, the issues published as part of this volume will be, be used to inform the UN system-wide report on emerging technologies and its impact on sustainable development. So in this vehicle, we're literally taking the voices of early career researchers and infusing it in science and technology policy debate at the highest of levels. We'll also be organizing panels comprised of authors during the UN Science Technology Forum in May in New York City, as well as the G. International Conference in Brussels later in 2020 in November. The second special issue is in partnership with the National Science Policy Network. For those of you who aren't familiar with this organization, it's a terrific group. NSPN is comprised of student-run science policy organizations all across the country. NSPN has received a number of supporters and sponsors from various foundations and other organizations in the space. As part of this partnership, uh, uh, we'll have a policy memo competition whereby the best papers in the issue will be uh, eligible for a cash prizes to support professional development of the authors of these issues. We'll also organize outreach around the special issues with NSPN, uh, those taking place at the NSPN symposium uh, next fall, as well as other webinars and online outreach vehicles to highlight published authors and their work. We had an issue that just came out that was sponsored by the Canadian Science Policy Center, which is sort of the, the AAAS of Canada, if you will. It's an organization that's really dedicated to engaging Canadians in science and technology policy debates. So uh, we are really pleased to have a strong presence at the Canadian Science Policy Conference meeting to launch this joint issue with CSEP. If you're interested in sponsoring or partnering with JSPG on an issue, please get in touch. We are actively looking for partners and would love to work with you. Yes, please. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Uh-oh. The mouse clicker is giving me a run for my money here. Another opportunity to engage with JSPG, of course, is not just submitting, but serving on the editorial board. We have here a really great panel of editors, current and former, to shed light on how the journal has contributed to their professional development as science policy professionals. We have calls for associate editors typically twice a year. Um, it's a great opportunity to really hone in on your research 
uh, chops across a wide array of topics, even if it's not necessarily your subject matter expertise. Um, editors have gone on to pursue a wide variety of careers in academia, in government, uh, in industry. Um, we have editors working for Facebook, for various uh, universities, for uh, government institutions and NGOs, as we will learn today. So serving as an editor is a great professional development opportunity for those uh, of you who have folks who would be interested in such a role. That's just a little bit more. And with that, I want to be succinct and turn things over to our really fantastic panel here. Thank you so much for, for listening and looking forward to the conversation. I'll now pause for a, a quick round of questions before introducing our fantastic panel. I've either been really clear or really boring. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Let me begin by introducing our fantastic moderator. Aaron Heath is the Associate Director of Government Relations at the American Association for the Advancement of Science, AAAS. AAAS is the world's largest general society, as I'm sure this group really knows quite well. Uh, Aaron has held a number of leadership positions in her capacity at AAAS, including with the Coalition for National Science Funding, the Golden Goose Award Steering Committee, the Engaging Scientists and Engineers and Policy Coalition, and a number of other groups. Erin is quite a force for science herself in this capacity. Before joining AAAS, Erin held government relations positions at various other scientific societies here in DC, as well as a, a career in, in science journalism with various news outlets. So really pleased to have Erin with us, uh, not just in this capacity, but as a member of the JSPG Governing Board. Next up, uh, next to Aaron, we have Lita Benison, who's our former editor-in-chief with the journal. Uh, Lita is currently a program officer at the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, another group that I'm sure this crowd knows quite well. Lita is a, a, gr a great leader for the Board on Higher Education and the Workforce. In her capacity at National Academy, she leads a number of studies touching a wide variety of science and te technology policy topics uh, and its intersection with education and, and workforce preparedness. Uh, previously, before coming to the National Academies, Lita was a AAAS fellow uh, at the National Science Foundation and um, held uh, positions at the University of Colorado Boulder where she uh, did her, her uh, graduate work. Next to Lita, we have uh, Ben Isakoff, who is our current editor. He provides uh, our most uh, recent perspective from the, the JSPG standpoint. Ben is currently at the State Department on the Science and Technology Policy team at State. Uh, before joining State, he was a AAAS fellow. Um, and Ben comes from University of Michigan, where I also have had an affiliation, so go blue. Sorry if there's, <laughs> there we go, go blue. Um, where he, he did his doctoral work in, in physics and engineering. So thank you all, Ben, Lita, and Aaron, for being here. And with that, I'll turn things over to our monitor, Aaron Heath, and uh, ask Aaron to take us away. All right, great. And I have to tell you, since we lost one of our panelists, Shailen has graciously agreed to also answer my questions. Uh, and Shailen, whose bio I don't have, but I might be able to tell you anyway, because we've worked so many years together. He, he works for the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities, and before that, he worked for the uh, American Academy of Arts and Sciences. So let's start with what you all have in common here, which is, which is your role that you have or have had with the, the journal, the JSPG. Uh, I'd love to hear about what, what you did for the journal. Uh, let's start with you, Lita. Okay, Can, am I laudable? Okay, great. Um, First of all, it's really um, quite an honor to be asked to be here and a privilege to address you. Um, I also feel very privileged to even have a job in science policy. It's um, as, a, as somebody who was trained as, a, as a, someone to go down the tenure track research path, uh, you know, faculty path, um, and then having broken loose from that path, um, it's very, very competitive because I think a lot of other great scientists have agreed that science policy is a very impactful career. Um, and I, I would say one of the reasons that the journal has been so impactful is multivariate, and, and I'll get into that in a bit. Um, but 
I actually started as an associate editor of the very first journal that um, JSPG had. I was very lucky that I had just started graduate studies in science policy um, to supplement my PhD studies. And just through word of mouth, um, somebody mentioned, I heard you're interested in science policy. There's this new journal. What do you think of joining as an editor? And um, to be quite frank, I was only trained in scientific writing. I had no idea how to write any other style of writing, and any other style of writing completely terrorized me, um, let alone policy writing. I had also just had a baby, and I wasn't quite sure how I was going to be able to balance both having um, a new child, um, being in a PhD program, suppling, supplementing it with a certificate policy program, um, and also serving as a volunteer editor for a totally new journal. But I really wanted to keep a foot in science policy um, while I was pursuing my degree. And I thought, well, you know, I hear moms are really good at inventing time out of thin air. I'll do my best. And um, it was a big learning curve. And I, because I felt like I owed it to the authors who were submitting, submitting to the journal, I worked really hard to be braver about my non-technical writing skills. And I was able to quickly learn policy writing and uh, learning about a broad swath of issues in science policy that I hadn't been exposed to before. And um, I was quickly excited to continue the work. And um, yeah, and that's how it all got started. Um, so I'm currently an associate editor <coughs> with the journal, and uh, what that role entails is being basically peer reviewer for the papers and also editor, and uh, the really cool thing I love about the journal is the editorial process at the journal is very different than um, a kind of a, a, a typical scientific journal where the editor is basically there to say thumbs up or thumbs down on whether it gets published at the at the journal we really work closely with the editors and go through a few uh, with the authors excuse me and go through a few rounds of revisions with them um, trying to make the paper stronger and that includes everything like oh you need to like have some references for this claim you're making to I'm not really sure if your argument makes sense here all the way down to even some copy editing and I, I actually really love this process it's it's really fun for me to dive deep into somebody else's work here and help them make it stronger so I really enjoy that a lot um, I got to the journal. Uh, I'd been familiar with the journal. Um, I actually submitted something when I was a student that was rejected. <laughs> um, and so I'd been familiar with the journal for a while, and then kind of as I was progressing through my, uh, through my education as a scientist and also in science policy, I thought um, I would be able to contribute as an editor, and uh, they accepted me, and I really enjoyed it ever since. Well, you all heard a little bit about my role with JSPG. I, I serve as a CEO, and prior to assuming this role, I was actually on the staff as a communications person. I was the one running our social media <coughs> channels and newsletters and, and websites and so forth. My foray to JSPG was actually also by happenstance. I was actually uh, um, an intern here in Washington, uh, wanting to learn a little bit more about the science and technology policy space, and I came across a PowerPoint presentation on the internet. I was just Googling science policy careers, and it was written by uh, somebody who is also affiliated with, with the journal on our board, Melanie Roberts, who is a AAAS fellow. And I know Melanie won't mind if I tell this story, so I'll go ahead and say it. I reached out to Melanie to ask if I could speak with her about her career. I was wondering if she might spend a couple of minutes with me on the phone. And she actually said, uh, I'm a little busy right now, but here's somebody else you could talk to. <laughs> and that happened to be none other than my predecessor as CEO, Max Bronstein. Um, I had a great conversation with Max, and Max asked me to, to join the staff. Uh, and for me, my work with JSPG has really just been a personal passion. I really think that we don't give enough credit to the next generation or current generation, depends how you cut it, of uh, scientists and engineers, or frankly, any professionals and policy debate and decision making. So uh, the opportunity to contribute to that mission is something that keeps me really energized. It's been so great to see JSPG grow over the years and expand into new partnerships, grow internationally. So that's sort of been my, my outcomes and sort of my story. Great here. So I'd like to hear more about 
I'd like to hear more about the skills that, that you gained from, from JSPG. And what, what skills this experience provided to you that you really didn't get from your traditional scientific training program? Uh, let's go with Ben, yeah. Sure, yeah. So a, as was gestured to earlier, um, writing, uh, the, the style of, uh, the, the practice of being an editor, of having to explain to somebody else what is wrong with their writing, uh, you know, as I think all of us know, having to teach something really forces you to understand it very deeply. And so the, the practice of being an editor um, has just super sharpened my own writing skills in a way that uh, being a scientist and even publishing a, a lot and writing different kinds of scientific materials never did. So definitely the writing. Mm -hmm. Shailen, we're going to you. This might be a controversial statement, but I'm known for that, so hopefully I won't have too many tomatoes thrown at me. Relevance. Uh, work with JSPG has really taught me about relevance of academic writing. Um, over my time with the journal, we've been lucky to have our, our work public, uh, cited by CNN and Washington Post and other groups, and that has really gotten me to just think about how we in the scientific community really bring our research to bear on, on society and the public at large. Um, so uh, it sort of really thinking more critically about what do we do once an issue comes out. It's not good enough for us to just send out through our mailing list and have our, our readership pool, our, our preaching to the choir, literally in some cases, <laughs> uh, thinking through some of our, our issues. How can, we, how can we have our policy writing brought to the broader community? That's been one thing that, that I've really learned from JSPG and continue to learn every day. Uh, so when I first joined the journal, I thought we were a national serving journal. Um, and so I thought all, and, and, and at first all of our submissions came from domestic uh, uh, authors. But by the third issue, we were getting a lot of international submissions. Now granted, some of them I think didn't quite read what our journal mission was. And I think they were just firing off articles wherever. But then we were actually starting to find folks who were from India or from um, other areas of Asia and Canada who were interested in submitting to our journal on science policy issues. And so for me, I was learning about the global context of our work, which I really hadn't understood before then. Wonderful. So I'd like to switch a bit and talk about your day jobs. Uh, and I'd like to hear, I'd like to hear more about uh, what you're doing in, in the 95 plus and, and how your editor experience or CEO experience helped prepare you for that, how it plugs into what you're doing now. Uh, we'll start with you, Shailen. Sure. In my uh, day job capacity, I work uh, for the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities, which is a, a trade association of public research universities in the US, Canada, and Mexico. And in my capacity at APLU, I really focus on two key areas of work, talent and workforce development and the future of work, and innovation, entrepreneurship, and community engagement, which is sort of a catch-all for everything else, I suppose. Um, and uh, I think one thing that's really helped me in terms of my role with JSBG and my role with APLU is, again, this connecting the university to community uh, experience and strategy. Um, a lot of what I do in the economic development and community engagement office at APLU is think about how we can bring the fruits of the university to bear on society at large. And I think in science policy, that's oftentimes what we do. We think about how we can bring our expertise out uh, to address problems and vice versa, how uh, problems of society can inform research and bring it to, to uh, influence um, our agenda. So it's been it's been that connectivity point, I think, the most, and some operational bits too, uh, fundraising and communications and and engagement and the work. So, Ben. Um, yeah. So I work at the State Department um, in the office of the Science and Technology Advisor to the Secretary, and I'm responsible for artificial intelligence policy uh, in that office, um, and. Uh, AI is an emerging technology, which also means that the government's policies and also staffing on this uh, area is also emerging. Uh, so there's a lot of work to do and not enough people. Um, so kind of am being everything AI at the State Department goes through me in one way or another. Uh, so it's, it's a pretty fun and dynamic role. 
Um, I'd say, you know, I already talked about the writing uh, skills I've developed being an editor, but um, one thing that I just always find useful and, and I'm constantly impressed at how much it is useful to me is that like actual things I learn from the papers I'm editing. Um, they're, you know, they're, you know, f you fairly long and in-depth articles uh, frequently and really delving into the details of these papers and working with these authors to make them stronger arguments. I, I learn a lot about the subject and they're, they're just, I always come back to them at some point or another. I'll be like, oh yeah, you know, actually, uh, you know, I learned about this in this paper I edited. And, you know, here, here's the, you know, and sometimes I'm able to share the reference too, which is fun. So I'd say, yeah, I, I learn a lot from the papers and that's always useful. Uh, so I'm a senior program officer at the National Academy's Board on Higher Education and Workforce. And I have a very broad portfolio uh, that I'm a direct, where I direct studies, and these studies are often developed to um, formulate evidence-based recommendations to instigate policy change. And my portfolio includes things such as upskilling a huge sector of the defense workforce on data capabilities. Um, another one of my projects is about um, how to improve the early career research pathway in the biomedical and behavioral sciences. Um, one of my more exciting projects is about uh, reevaluating promotion and tenure for STEM faculty across the country. And then my, my pet project, my favorite project, is understanding the impacts of intercollegiate athletics on uh, governance at universities and colleges across the country. So my portfolio is very broad, and I am directing all of those programs in, in addition to other uh, topic areas as well. I absolutely love it. And I would say that um, two aspects of working as editor-in-chief for the journal were really key to my current job. And one of them, echoing what you both said, was the writing aspect and the relevancy and, and content aspects as well. So I learned to be a better writer. I can't be a technical writer for the National Academies or nobody will read my report and the recommendations will be completely useless and that will be taxpayer investment dollars or philanthropic dollars that were wasted. So the writing is incredibly important and I feel like it's very high stakes and I'm extremely glad that the journal was a stepping stone for me to increase uh, my writing and communication skills. And then secondly, the content areas that I was exposed to after having to read all the articles that were either as submissions or that we ended up publishing really uh, broadened my knowledge of, um, of the content areas that are touched by science and technology policy. So um, that's just a, I feel like that's just painting the, the brush very, very broadly, but it, it really did make a difference. I was not getting that experience um, in my um, graduate career. Well, that's fantastic. You're all doing such interesting work, and to know that the journal has really, really carried through to this current work is, is wonderful to hear. Uh, so I want to think uh, uh, think about our audience. We have faculty in the audience. We have, we have senior policy leaders. What would you say to them about how you know JSPG has a lot of, of, of early career researchers that submit and. and what would you say to faculty and senior leaders about how best to prepare these students, how best to be mentors to these uh, students and early career researchers? Uh, Rita, we'll start with you this time. Uh, <laughs> well, just so happens, um, the, if, if you are interested in mentoring um, emerging science policy leaders and scholars, we at the National Academies just released a consensus study report on the science of effective mentorship and so um, if, if that is something that you're interested in doing, I'd be happy to put you in contact with that resource. Um, and for those of you that have a lot of contact with students or early career folks in science policy who are looking for ways to improve um, their communication skills, their writing skills, or their exposure to current and relevant topic areas, I would really encourage um, you to let them know about the journal and encourage them to um, submit to the journal or um, offer to work as, a, as an associate editor as well. You don't have to have had extensive policy experience to be an editor. Um, and it, it really does make a huge difference to one's development in this area. Fighting skills or fighting skills? <laughs> Political fighting, all sorts of writing. No, no just the writing skills. <laughs> I think both are important. <laughs> you probably said something more about this earlier, but may I ask, who is your readership? I mean, ideally it would be people in government, but I don't know that it is. Right. 
Yeah, that's a great question. This has actually been something we've been honing in on a little bit more. The journal is nearing its 10 year anniversary. So you've been around just long enough where we have the data to begin doing some trend analysis. Um, but we're also early enough in our stage to be thinking about what's next. Our readership is typically comprised of um, early career researchers, which is also our publication audience, and um, academic community. Um, government, yes, but it tends to be more at the, the NGO level where we have the most subscribers at the national academies, at various think tanks, at various associations and scientific societies. In terms of federal or national organizations uh, or, or governments, we tend not to have as much readership, but that's something that we're working on addressing through outreach strategies. So for example, we've recently partnered with Science Debate, which is an organization dedicated to elevating science issues in elections, and uh, um, uh, be it at the state or national level. Um, and we're hoping that partnerships like that would elevate published work uh, in sort of the policymakers arena as opposed to just the, the think tank or policy community um, here in DC or in other areas. The other thing that we're doing to bring in another constituency is thinking a little bit more about what science policy issues are most salient for policymakers today. Science and security, for example, comes to mind. Of course, climate action is imperative. Cybersecurity and the governance of, of technology, emerging technologies. So we're working at developing strategies and strategic partnerships around most critical or visible, I suppose I should say, issues for policymakers to connect with them. But in terms of main readership, it tends to be the academic community and the policy community, but not necessarily the political community or, or folks in government. Great question. At this moment, do we have any uh, other audience questions? I want to make sure to give you all plenty of time. Yes. Um, I heard you mention policy analysis, so I, I quickly looked at your site and was impressed by these short policy analyses where uh, the writer talks about options for a given policy issue and looks at the advantages, disadvantages. And I was wondering, uh, given the policy aspect of the journal, whether you have considered or actually um, accept articles that take a deeper dive into the, the selection of policy options, something akin to the Harvard case method that's been there for many, many years, where you uh, look at a, a complex policy issue but really look at the benefits, costs, risks, legal aspects, and so on uh, around, uh, around science policy. I, I thought the shorter pieces were entirely appropriate because those are the types of products that are generated in, in for example, government policy offices. It's brief, succinct, and, and, and makes a recommendation. But the analysis is, is less than some of these issues would probably warrant in a, in a real world setting. The answer is yes, uh, in, in short. Um, one challenge I think we have in that uh, sometimes our, our authors may not have the clearest understanding in which format's most suitable for the position they're trying to make. Uh, their students, early career researchers, early career professionals. So um, in terms of submissions, we tend to be quite flexible, actually. Um, white papers, gray papers, green papers, all of these various things. Um, we even had an inquiry recently about an infographic. <laughs> um, that was backed by research and connected to a white paper. Um, but um, it really depends on who submits. Uh, so for consideration, yes, we're broad. Uh, and encourage more innovative formats. After all, we're in the 21st century. We can evolve a bit in how we publish in journals, but uh, I think it really depends on submissions. I don't know, Lita, if you have a perspective on this. Um, so my perspective is we want to be as useful as possible. We want the journal to serve the greatest utility, and so it does that in several ways. It does that first in you know, being a journal to highlight policy areas, but it also ser serves partially as a professional development tool for young researchers and scientists to try to sort of get some experience in writing for science policy. With that said, I think you, you make an extraordinary great point that we should consider. And we could actually say we're looking specifically for submissions that are going to be more broad policy or deep dive policy um, analyses and sort of point to a few kind of examples of what, what that might look like to help guide our, the young scholars who do submit. 
if, if that would be useful to the broader uh, scholarly community. And, and if that would, I think we could absolutely make a call for those sorts of submissions. And I have a feeling you know, we get a lot of submissions, mm -hmm. a, a lot. I think it's at some point several hundred, um, depending on the season. Um, and I think, it, I think our submitters, the authors, would be very grateful for some guidelines there too. And we don't necessarily need to publish a submission um, right after, you know, in the, in, the ep, in the edition that's gonna come right after. We have in the past actually sometimes worked with the authors for over, almost a year to help them actually make sure they improve the quality of their work. We'll say, you know, you've got a great idea here, but clearly you're really new to this, and we'll take the time to work with them and make sure it's a quality piece of work before it's published. And that might be a great case, um, something we could do as well with these deeper policy memos or analyses. Uh, my question is for Shane. I'm uh, Richard Jordan. I'm the Dean of NGO Representatives at the UN over 40 years, every day, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. unless I'm at something like this. Um, Shane, number one, uh, there are nine major groups under agenda, from Agenda 21, uh, and other communities of practice from the 2012 uh, negotiations on the Sustainable Development Goals. How did you come into the relationship with the uh, major group of, on children and youth? And secondly, how are your special issues um, identified? Yeah, fantastic question. The partnership with the UN Major Group was was uh, actually uh, organically, uh, they had reached out to us, uh, Donovan Gutierrez, uh, who is the, the science and, and tech, uh, I believe it's called Science Policy Interface Lead or focal group uh, contact. He'd reached out and, and asked if we would be interested in something like this, and of course we were we were happy to, to engage. Um, in terms of how our partnerships are formed, it's, it's through interactions like this, actually. If we identify a, an organization or a partner that's interested in working with us, um, we're, we're quite flexible in our ability to do so. Uh, sometimes to the chagrin of the editorial team uh, for ever expanding portfolio, but um, there, it's, it's quite flexible in terms of who we partner with. So I'd love to connect with you or anyone else in the audience on partnerships. Oh, the other thing I should mention on, on the, uh, the uh, UN partnership in particular, we also have some guidance from our board. Uh, Ernesto fernandez Polish. Uh, the chief of science policy at UNESCO is one of our board members, and, and he had done some advising for us on how to reach out to different groups. Um, uh, we've also had some level of collaboration with, I am going to butcher this name, maybe my State Department colleague can correct me, the International Science Council, is that right? Uh, it used to be called ICSU. That's right, ICSU, um, about some collaborations you might do with them, so but would love to, to chat. I was wondering, if you get an article that you think might be of general interest, do you ever issue a specific press release for that article? Because if you send your journal to uh, mass media publications, they're not going to read it, but they might read a press release. Yes, but not enough. We typically have general press releases for volumes, but our director of communications is working on a new strategy that would actually be focused on direct press release outreach for each of our published issues. And also, a dedicated uh, sort of contact list for each of the articles. We had an article in our latest issue that talked about the reestablishment of OTA. Well, I imagine that'd be a pretty salient topic for a number of the science policy news publications. But we had another issue that talked about the opioids epidemic and how to mitigate. That might be of interest to a different crop of, of media outlets. So doing more dedicated outreach is something that the, we're trying to do more on the staff side with guidance from the editorial side as well. Uh, I worked on the OTA article and I would highly encourage everybody to read it. <laughs> uh, the author did a phenomenal job. And actually, I was editing that article while working on the Hill on science policy. So, like, this is some of the cool things that the, the journal is able to accomplish. A great article. Highly recommend it. <laughs> well, we welcome additional advice on how we can increase the relevance of the journal. You know, it's 10 years old. It's very young, um, but it's a very eager group of volunteers and submitters. And so, you know, we, we want to be impactful. We want to be relevant. So, I, I thank you for that advice. So I'd like to, 
to go, I'd like to talk about the industry a little bit, and, and you, you've all taken on roles with, with the journal. Uh, what was the biggest surprise or challenge about the work that you did with GSPG, and, and do you look at journals and the publishing industry differently now? Daniel Legretti. Well, I, I have never been a big fan of the way that academic publishing works. Uh, in uh, many aspects of, of how academic publishing and scholarly journals work. I think there's a lot of problems there. And, you know, I don't know that the system that the JSPG uses is like the answer to all of the problems, but I find it to be, um, to, to have a lot less of those problems. So, for example, um, the editorial process I mentioned earlier about working with the authors to make the argument stronger, to uh, really delve into the issue is super rewarding for me as an editor and I think helps authors really make the paper much stronger. I am unfamiliar of anything like that in uh, any kind of academic journal I have ever published in. Um, so I, I think that might be something that has changed the way I look at, at these things and see, you know. It's not necessarily a intervention I would have pointed to uh, as being a problem in scholarly publishing before, but now something I'm, I'm pretty curious about. And your biggest surprise or challenge? I realized I crammed two questions together there, so mm. what was your? Well, yeah, uh, a, a big challenge um, I dealt with recently was with, um, it, it was a really interesting experience. It was with an international author, um, as was mentioned earlier, and I was actually teamed up with one of our, uh, another associate editor who's based in India. Uh, and the submission was from an Indian student uh, writing about space policy issues in India. And so I know a lot about space policy. I don't really know a lot about the, the context in India. And um, we were ha I was having a number of issues with this student uh, ranging from things like kind of grammatical errors in his writing um, to just, again, like I didn't really know much about the political context in India, even though I do know a, a lot about the kind of larger space discussions he was having. And so that, that was a challenge for me. It was, it was really helpful to be working with the other editor who is from India and can kind of help bridge those gaps. But yeah, it was a challenging experience. Anita, what do you think? Um, <clears throat> so, so what surprised me during my experience is actually the increased velocity of which we were getting submissions. Um, I thought we were a really kooky journal. Like, honestly, if you weren't searching for us, how would you find us? How would you know to submit to us? Um, but the fact that like year after year we were getting more submissions made us feel like we must be addressing some sort of, um, you know, want out there in the scholarly world that just isn't being filled. And so we've been, as you know, as such, we've been evolving as fast as we can, but staying true to our core about being a journal that's for early career researchers and, and students in science policy. Um, I, I, I mean, challenge was really trying to do it all while also, you know, being in the, in the, the programs that I was. But another thing that surprised me is, um, I, maybe you have this as well, I have a lot of people who reach out to me to ask me, I, I, you know, I'm interested in a career in science policy. Tell me how you got here. What was the work that you did? What were the steps that you take? And I always mention my experience with the journal. And for a lot of them, whether they live in DC, but especially if they're not from DC, um, and they're you know, in a, a master's program, let's say in New Mexico or Washington State, and they're looking for opportunities to get involved in policy, to increase their policy experience because they hope to come out here one day and get a job. Um, there is a lot of eagerness when I tell them about the journal because that's an opportunity for them, no matter where they are, um, no matter what their constraints are, that they can actually start engaging in science policy topics in a meaningful way as they prepare to build uh, their resumes for um, a potential career in science policy. And that, it really surprised me how of all the things that I had done in preparation to get here, that one seemed like the most accessible and a great first step for a lot of folks. Great, thank you. Shailen, what do you think? So the answer, the question is uh, surprising, su something surprising and then something that, that you think is a challenge? Yes, and also if, if, if anything you learned from these has changed your perspectives on the industry. On the industry. Helped. I'll start there with that third point. Um, I have become more attuned to the importance of open access journals. JSPG is entirely an open access publication. 
and I think that is really important. I, I serve as an editor of another journal, and um, what I've learned is I, I, I don't think I could ever uh, contribute to a publication that isn't open access. I think it's a detriment to science to not have an open access um, peer review system. So that is my, my little flag that I wave around in terms of the industry. Uh, uh, mindful of the complications working with university administrators for the living with the open access space, um, and of course working with scientific societies. But that's been something that, that I picked up on. I think one, um, one thing that is a challenge for us is this question of relevancy. Um, how can we bring these voices to bear on decisions um, I think it's become ever more clear that any sort of policy-oriented publication outlet is going to have to need to think through to what end. And we, I think, are going to be needing to do that a little bit more. We have a lot of opportunity. As Lita said, there's a lot of interest in this, this work. And I think science and technology issues are becoming more relevant for policy. As we enter an election year, I think that would likely increase. Um, so there may be more opportunities to broker new partnerships. Um, something else that has been, I think, a, a challenge and an opportunity for us is, is reaching out to, is, is getting across the fact that science policy is not necessarily just what happens here in Washington or in London or in Brussels or in New Delhi. Um, and thinking about local level science policy issues, na international science and technology policy issues is something that I think we can work on a little bit more. Um, thinking about the Flint water crisis, that was discovered due to a Michigan State researcher engaging with that community on policy topics. Um, you know, I think there's an opportunity for JSPG to serve scientists and engineers who are working locally, which is why we're partnering with the organization, Scientists and Engineers Acting Locally, so. Excellent. Uh, I'm going to ask you three questions about some of the things you said earlier in the panel. Uh, and this first one is for you, Ben, but I welcome perspectives from all three of you. Uh, and you mentioned that AI is part of your portfolio. And I'd be curious to hear your thoughts about AI and how it might impact publishing, how it might impact journals, how it might impact journal editors. Well, um, I, I, I would bet money um, that everybody here uh, has uh, inadvertently read an article written at least partially by an AI, and you didn't know it. it, it this has been happening for a few years now. Um, various kinds of news outlets or other um, publications are supplementing uh, human writers with artificial intelligences. Like I said, it's been happening for a while. Um, a lot of the uh, headlines uh, for some articles are procedurally generated now with artificial intelligences. Um, so uh, the headlines you see on some publications or social networks, some other things like this, aren't the same for everybody. They were designed for you in particular based on your profile, uh, et cetera. So yeah, it's already, already changing uh, publishing. Um, now, there's a big difference between like some kind of little news article about, about some small development um, and you know, a piece of scholarly work. There's still a big gulf between these two things. Um, but you know, we are all extremely comfortable now uh, relying on uh, grammar checks and spell checks and these kind of things. And um, I, I think probably everybody has noticed how good, for example, Google Translate has gotten. Uh, Google Translate, when it got really good, was because they switched from, uh, you know, based on uh, we'll say a huge massive amount of labor of humans to using AIs and natural language processing. That's what, what, that's what made it so good when they did that. Um, it's based on deep learning models and natural language processing. So, you know, at, as these, you know, spell check and grammar, grammar checks, you know, have already changed how we write. Um, and as they get better and more nuanced and as things like translate also get better, um, it's, they're going to continue to change how we write, even in scholarly uh, publications. Interesting. Any other thoughts on AI? Okay, Lita, I'm going to turn to you. You mentioned, I don't think you called it this, but the juggle, essentially, balancing 
uh, your job, your, your role with the journal, family, et cetera. And I seized on it because I think about this myself all the time. Um, so I want to hear from you, but also the other panelists. Uh, you know, what's kind of one lesson learned from tr trying to balance all these different elements um, or one secret to, to your success? Um, okay, so I, I don't have any balance in my life. All right, I'm, just, I'm balanceless. Um, with that said, I treat everything that I do with a great sense of urgency. And if, it, if I don't feel a great sense of urgency, I don't do it. So, you know, family, that's urgent. Um, I feel like all the projects that I take on at the National Academies, they feel urgent to me, so I do them. The work of the, giant, the Science Policy Journal, you know, when they need me, um, I feel like the, getting, helping the journal grow and become more relevant and impactful is urgent. And so that's why I spend my time on it. And, um, you know, I think you just get, you get used to it. I, I think I'm, I'm starting to get tired of the strive for balance. And I'm just like, you know what? If I keep worrying about the fact that I don't have it, it's just going to make things worse. So as long as I feel like I'm fueled by a sense of urgency and, um, you know, and I've got a good support network, that's, that's what I do. It's a terrible answer. No, I love that answer. <laughs> Thank you. It's real. Shay yeah, yeah. Shaylin, now I, I sometimes call Shaylin the Energizer Bunny. So I, I, I know you have thoughts on this as well. Well, it's funny you mentioned that. <laughs> I was actually going to say, um, I spend my time on things that get me the most excited. Um, and JSPG is one of those things. Um, oh, actually, Aaron, this connects to, to your previous question in terms of um, what have you sort of learned from your experience. So one unique thing about JSPG and and Ben touched on this too. We don't necessarily, we don't, in the words of one of my favorite figures in this space, Michael Crow, president of Arizona State, who is also one of the few university presidents with a PhD in science technology policy, um, we don't evaluate success by who we exclude. We evaluate who success by who we include and help thrive. So JSPG doesn't have some sort of quota. We don't care about uh, our, our, our acceptance rates. If there's quality submissions coming in, we'll, we'll publish them. Um, if they're if they're meeting that benchmark, so the passion I guess is the through line for me. You know the idea that the, whenever we hear from former editors or authors or uh, staff members that JSPG really contributed to my career, my personal professional growth, that is a win for me, and that's what keeps me involved with JSPG. It's it's been about eight years now, so <laughs> it's been quite a while. So yeah. Um, so one thing um, that ha I think has just paid like infinite dividends for me is um, uh, I work really, really hard to take care of my bi my body and mind. Uh, so like basically it means like I don't skimp on sleep. I'm always really careful about what and how much I eat and when I'm doing that. And I, I don't miss workouts. Like, and I find that this allows me to. Uh, to do all, to, to get a lot of other things done in my life uh, because I just won't be as effective at those things if I didn't get enough sleep or if I've been eating crappy or something like that. So, yeah, just being really dedicated to that has helped. I'm so impressed by all of you right now. Uh, <laughs> all right, Shaylin, this one's for you. <laughs> uh, but also, I'd love to hear from the two of you. Uh, it, you mentioned, you talked about you've seen the journal grow over the years. So where is the journal going next? Oh, gosh, <laughs> the million-dollar question. Um, <laughs> Where, where, what is the future of the journal, the SPG? You know, I, I, I think it goes back to, to what I was mentioning earlier in terms of relevance. Uh, certainly the traditional metrics of any publication, getting more submissions in the door, getting more quality publications out the door. Um, but I think this question of relevance, how do we make these articles relevant for the scholarly community and the policy decision makers in the US and around the world, I think that's going to be our distinguishing factor and sort of something that we'd want to hone in and focus in on more. How do we do that? To be determined. <laughs> Would welcome guidance from, from this group on that. Um, I think it, it, it definitely involves partnerships with other organizations. We are a very collaborative group from the very beginning. We've been collaborative. So working with others who also serve and share our mission of empowering early career researchers in science policy, um, I think that might be the vehicle for it. But um, 
becoming more relevant and becoming more visible, elevating these voices, I think, is, is the goal. Yeah. Because you just interjected a question or a query or suggestion, here, in the name of journalists, journalist science policy and governance, and I think it's notable that you're, you're trying to promote, you know, younger emerging scholars and scientists, etc., which is very laudable. And <coughs> governance, on the other hand, although there are a lot of emerging people in government, most of the people who are really working on implementing policy and so forth are of an older generation. So you've got a, a you, you know, you have something here that needs to be addressed a little bit. Uh, and I'm just wondering two things. One, and, and also a suggestion involving this conference. One is, have you done anything like, look at what in your tenure history, can you point to any particular article that actually had impact? You know, and, and discuss, you know, the case history. The other thing that I would just suggest is that often, in order to get something policy that involves governance, you have to know where are the holes in governance, where can you make suggestions that isn't already, already occupied. You know, um, and at this conference today, in a small session, there are two people who I happen to know who are the older generation, uh, Bob, Bob Maxley and Stuart of uh, Humblebee who are going to be talking about gun control things. And what's happened there, I recommend it to go and look there, it's that somebody who's had a career working in government and so forth, and who's practiced in like, okay, here's the way we usually address this, you know. But are there any other ways, knowing what, you, you know, what the laws are like, and what the possibilities of what you could manipulate with regulation, et cetera, et cetera. What else can you do? And so, kind of the suggestion about gun control, which is not to take on the people that are, um, but sort of have a different, sort of doing a run as it were. Mm -hmm. And I'm just suggesting that you need to know something about what the laws are like and where you could place them. And frequently that involves touching the touch. And the other thing about AI, though, I think it has a lot of good possibilities. It's also constraining. Because people introduce new things with AI, including new conceptual terminology. We'll get a fine, and that meant fine. You know. And you know, it really it really puts a little bit of a crimp in creativity, which is what we want our young people to be doing. So just be careful. It's interesting because a lot of, um, so like uh, Karl Marx, for example, would be very excited about AI. Uh, he would see it as uh, a technology to free the labor, free the masses from menial labor so that they can be creative, actually. Um, yeah, so, I, you know, it's, uh, what, what, which path we go down, I think, is yet to be determined. Um, but it, it definitely is changing the world, no question about that. Yes. I like that observation really very much. Um, I see you guys look like a bunch of babies to me. And congratulations. I'm 75. I just got my, um, my PhD in um, 2015. So.
and, and your beginning process, you're just the perfect people to deal with it because definitions are very, very important at, at the beginning of an enterprise. And your definition of what you're interested in would be very servicing to the, to the industry if you pay attention to that. Sorry, I can't say your name. Marilyn. Marilyn. Yes. To that perspective. That is, not, you're, you're not looking for, for articles that make scientific contributions. Mm. You're not, but, but, but because of how compelling that is, you'll get a lot of, of submissions that are focusing on contributions which are purely scientific. You're not really looking for long, long enough dissertations on, on the policy aspect of it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but this, this, this governance piece is huge. And how you get from point A to point B in the policy arena on a scientific initiative. That if you could hone in on that question, let me tell you, the policy community, if they haven't learned, would be really, really compelled to pay attention to what you're doing. And if you put that definition out there of what your interest area is, that would be very focused and very helpful. Um, I, uh, I can talk about it. Um, that, but I just wanted to, I just wanted to emphasize um, the importance of what Alan has just said. Definitions, definitionally, if you define your interest in governance that way, um, it would be very, very powerful. These are wonderful points. Thank I, you. I guess sort of two thoughts on the governance piece. Uh, the first is, um, I correct me if I'm wrong. I thought I picked up on this theme of you know how do you connect these early career researchers with established leaders in the space. That is absolutely a connectivity point for us. Um, uh, our advisory board, we've actually sometimes gotten criticism for this, saying your advisory board are comprised of all of these old people. <laughs> you know, you, I thought you were about to early career. It's important that those, those, uh, those uh, established leaders are connected to the journal, because without them, how do we have the governance perspective in the first place? Um, so we have some mechanism through our advisory and governing board and through external reviewers. Occasionally, we may do need to reach out to external reviewers um, to make sure that those who have experience and content expertise are connected to the journal's work. Um, I think we can expand on that a little bit more. Typically, we've partnered with groups that share our mission of engaging early career researchers. It might be interesting to, and I know National Academy has also has been thinking about this, it might be interesting for us to think about how to connect these early career researchers with policy interests and some level of developing expertise um, with established leaders in the space for either review or mentorship or outreach. Um, and then on the other point to just sort of uh, the definitions and, and focusing on issues around governance, that also I think is an area of opportunity for us. I suppose the reason why we focus on policy is because our partners have been policy organizations. Um, we haven't partnered with many organizations focused on governance. It might be interesting to do that, including some companies. Uh, one of our former editor-in-chiefs, uh, Elaine Zedenberg, is now working on data policy at Facebook. I'm sure she has quite some perspectives on how governance of data policy might work and bearing on policy work, so, yeah. 30 seconds because we're running out of time. You're, you're out dealing with the wrong demographics, in my opinion. Since I was one of the co-founders of the International Day for Women and Girls in Science, along with Her Royal Highness Princess Dr. Nasreen al Hashemite, the Executive Director of the Royal Academy of Science International Trust, that is the person you should be dealing with. Kyle <laughs> Ostemir, who is 14 years old, Girls who are making decisions about science need to know when they're 14, not when they're 26 or 27. It's very good, you know, whenever you do it. But that's the demographic you need to reach. So I invite you to participate in February 11th, the Girls Summit of the International Day for Women and Girls in Science. Thank you. Thank you. So in our last two minutes, I'm going to ask one final question. Um, Let's say you had unlimited resources, unlimited access to experts, your dream special issue. Oh Shailen, go. <laughs> Me first. 
I think we just run on the other <laughs> side there. I'm going to need some more time to think. Um, okay, well, um, special issue. Okay, so it's it's a 70-year anniversary of NSF, as, as 70th, and um, that may seem like a relatively average anniversary, but I think it's significant. Um, and um, one topic I know a lot in the community have been thinking about is uh, Vannevar Bush's Endless Frontiers model and how we think about science funding in the United States. Um, and I think a special issue that would be really fascinating is to explore um, new models for science technology policy um, uh, with respect to endless frontiers. Does that uh, thinking still hold true today? Does Moore's law still hold true today? Does the connectivity between basic and applied research still hold true today? Um, and if not, how should it change? Um, I think a special issue that explores the fundamentals of how science is conducted might be a really interesting thing to do, especially uh, here in Washington, D.C. So that would be my provocative, but interesting, I think, it, special issue. Got it, Ben? I, I, have, I have a million subjects I, I would love to see a whole special issue on, a, a, endless founts of those. Uh, um, but. Uh, I, I guess just uh, to pick one that I think is particularly uh, intriguing or maybe controversial would be um, I would love to have a special issue of the journal dedicated to the policy issues that will arise when we start seriously having human settlements off of Earth. Mm. Something I'm super interested in. <laughs> Going to be a lot of, you know, and, and you'll notice, for example, I very specifically said settlements and not colonies. Colonization, extremely loaded term, and this is, I think, points to and gestures to mm -hmm. some of the huge policy issues we will have. Brilliant. Are you going to take us home? Um, I would love to do a special issue on the assault on truth um, and the relevance, the assault on truth, right, and the relevance of science in today's decision making and governance. Thank you so much. Uh, that is a perfect note to end on. I want to thank all of you for being here, and I want to thank our panelists. Thank you.